Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, if you're enjoying our legal education content, please remember to hit the subscribe button. It helps our channel grow. For today's live stream, we are going to be doing a live reaction to John Oliver's segment on Stand Your Ground. So HBO last week tonight did a segment on Stand Your Ground, and I've been avoiding it. I've been avoiding it because I watch a lot of John Oliver. I normally find him funny, and although not necessarily accurate, and I was like, this is going to hurt me if I watch this, because I know quite a lot about Second Amendment law. I know more than pretty much everybody because of the amount of research I've done into the Second Amendment law. Uh, when I was, you know, I used to be a legal advisor for a gun rights group, and I think I read all the briefs in Heller and McDonald and all, like all the law reviews that preceded it. There's a lot of them, but I read all of them. So my knowledge of the Second Amendment is fairly deep. And my knowledge of Stand Your Ground is fairly deep. And my knowledge of firearms is fairly deep. It's a subject I know a fair amount about. So I've been avoiding this because there's no way this is going to be anything close to accurate. And I might have an aneurysm, and that sounds like a bad plan. But we're going to do it anyway, and we're going to do it together. We're going to watch the whole thing. We're going to watch the whole thing, and we're going to comment heavily along the way for our fair use protections, which I'm sure we'll have no problem doing because of the amount of stupid we're about to witness. So we'll watch the stupid, and we'll comment on the stupid and all the rest of it. So I have not watched this. I only watched about the first 30 seconds of it in order to test the audio levels. And after that, I stopped watching. So we're going to watch this together for the first time in all of its glory. Great. Let's let's do that now. All right. Fantastic. Here we go. Just a little there. That looks better. Here we go, kids. Moving on, our main story tonight concerns guns. You know, big pew pew sticks that go boom boom. Guns are everywhere in America. Oh yeah, we're off to a promising start right off the bat, right? Pew pew sticks that go boom boom. Totally have it. We totally have a neutral opinion of firearms and guns, right? We're coming into this objectively and looking at this from a reasoned position with the pew pew sticks that go boom boom. Uh huh. All right. America, and I do mean everywhere. How many guns you think I can hide underneath a Hawaiian shirt? Of course, we got the gray man. Got my Beretta Model 85. Feels like a car arm CT45. Charter arms, undercover, 38 special. Grandpa Dave's old Derringer. This is a Sky CPX2. Smith & Wesson 442. Oh wait, one more. North American arms, Sidewinder, 22 Magnum. Just in case you need something small. Wow. That is the second most horrifying thing you can find coming at you in a Hawaiian shirt right after John Lasseter on National Hug Your Boss Day. Okay, so first thing, so many things that we can comment on here. So his thesis is guns are everywhere. And to prove this thesis, he finds one guy who apparently was conducting some kind of challenge on how many guns can you conceal on yourself. So we're, we're creating the impression, I suppose, that this is the norm, right? Because we say guns are everywhere. And so this is the state of people who carry guns. They, they, have, they have all the guns on them at all times. And there, there, there are people around you with 13 guns on them. It seems unlikely. But we're going to create the impression of this is how ubiquitous it is. So, yeah, okay. Or, yeah, all right, fair. Let's carry on. Although I will say, the reveal of the Thumbelina sized gun in his Tommy Bahama pocket was an M. Night Shyamalan worthy twist. Well done, Tiny Gun. You are both superfluous and surprising. Okay, so he wants to mock the 22 Derringer that he has in his pocket, which you can see on screen here this little 22 parent Derringer. 22 Magnum, I believe it is, for whatever it's worth. So. Is there a use case for this firearm? Sure, there's a use case for every firearm. Every firearm has trade-offs. 
every firearm has benefits. Well, what's the what's the what's the obvious benefit of this firearm? It's incredibly small. That would be its advantage. Now that comes with disadvantages in terms of capacity, in terms of size of in terms of ammunition size, in terms of caliber, in terms of a lot of things, but it's incredibly small. So is there a use case for this? Sure. People have been using derringers for years and years and years. And derringers come in a wide variety of calibers. You can get 22 Magnum caliber, you can get 38, you can get nine millimeter, you can get all kinds of calibers, depending on what you need. So, you know, it's really, really small, really, really easy to conceal. You can literally put it in the palm of your hand. It's extremely lightweight. So there's a use case for it. It doesn't make it superfluous. I, you know, there, there's a case to be had. Let me put it to you this way. If, if you were pointing a 22 Magnum Derringer at me, I would not feel comfortable in getting shot. I wouldn't be saying to myself, oh, this is just a 22 Magnum Derringer. No big deal. If I'm on the wrong end of that barrel, man, uh, you know, uh, I'm not feeling the most confident I've ever felt in my life. So there's that. But yeah, it's okay. Let's mock the 22 Derringer for some reason. But this story isn't so much about guns themselves as it is about one particular law that significantly expanded how they're used. I'm talking about stand your ground laws. Oh my God. 30 states currently have them. And while they were... Is that right? Uh, that might be right. No, Virginia has stand your ground unless they changed it. Yeah, Virginia has stand your ground unless that's changed since I left. It's not codified. There's not a statute for standard ground. It's common law in Virginia, but I am a Virginia lawyer. So Virginia, also California has standard ground. Again, not by statute, but by common law. I know this. I know this. This map is wrong. This map is under-inclusive. Virginia has standard ground. California has standard ground. In both cases, it's not by statute. It's by common law. It hasn't been codified, but it's law all the same. And I can't speak to every other state on this map, but I'm willing to bet a few other ones have stand your ground. So the Gifford Law Center to prevent gun violence is making an under-inclusive map. Uh, yeah, okay, let's, okay, press on. initially pitched as a law and order measure to protect people forced to make difficult decisions in impossible life or death situations. In practice, they can be evoked in incidents that really seem like they didn't need to turn deadly. The man who shot and killed a father of four at a fluorescent bar is free tonight. So far, the gunman's not facing charges for the shooting at Show Me's Bar and Grill on Wednesday afternoon. The St. Louis County prosecutor says he needs more time to decide whether he'll prosecute the gunman. That's because Missouri's stand your ground law is complicated. Scott Berry was killed when an argument over how heavy a dog could weigh became physical. Holy shit. Okay, we need more information. We need more information to adjudicate this like good lawyers, right? We need more information to adjudicate this like good lawyers, all right? So the standard law being ground law being complicated is probably not the issue. The immediate issue is, is this valid self-defense? And as I'm probably going to mention several times in this video, standard ground doesn't change the underlying logic of self-defense. It just changes the circumstances in which you can use it slightly, but it doesn't change. It changes the kind of where you can use it, but not the how, if that makes sense. So standard ground doesn't change how, it changes where, all right? So the how of self-defense law is consistent across the board. You can use lethal self-defense in the form of a firearm or any other lethal mechanism you might have available if there's an imminent threat of death or grievous bodily harm. That threat has to be both subjectively perceived and objectively reasonable. It means that you actually need to feel that you are a threat, in threat, and that perception must be objectively reasonable. So merely because you think it doesn't control, because maybe you're an idiot. Merely because people at large think it doesn't control, because maybe you don't feel that fear. You need both right? So stand your ground just changes the where, just like castle doctrine does. 
Same idea. It doesn't, castle doctrine doesn't change the how either. It just changes where, right? It changes where. So whether or not you're in your home, in your car, out on the street, in a business, anywhere, anywhere, same logic. You can use self-defense, lethal self-defense, if there's an imminent threat of death or grievous bodily harm that is subjectively perceived and objectively reasonable. In the case of stand your ground, it simply adds the modifier that you don't need to attempt to flee in, if you could do so in complete safety. That would be the other modifier, right? So it doesn't change how you can use self-defense, it just changes where. And the idea is if you can flee, you should flee. And stand your ground says, well, you didn't do anything wrong. You're not a bad actor, so you have no obligation to flee. It doesn't change how you can use self-defense, though. It just changes the where. Same thing with castle doctrine. It, because you're in your home, you have no duty to flee. That's basically castle doctrine. It's like stand your ground, but in your house. And we called it something different because it came first. Right? So we call it castle doctrine. Same idea. You're in your home, you have no duty to flee. But so that changes the where, but not how. So we need to know more about this incident, about this dog. So this dog incident turned into a physical fight. Okay, what is the nature of the physical fight? What implements are being used in this fight? Is someone posing an imminent threat of death or grievous bodily harm to someone else? I don't know. Neither do you. We don't have enough information. We don't have enough information to adjudicate this. So was it a good shoot or not? I don't know. Neither do you. Based on the segment, at least, we don't know. If the guy was if the guy was holding a knife, if the guy picked up like a steak knife or something, that'd do it. So okay. I mean, yeah, all right, let's press on. Not only is that a massive overreaction, it's a pointless argument. Everyone knows dogs come in a wide array of sizes, from pocket-sized sweeties to slender kings, to dense boys, to droopy boys, to big honking boys, to standard. That's just veterinary science. Standing ground laws gained notoriety nearly a decade ago when police claimed that Florida's law kept them from initially arresting George Zimmerman after he shot and killed 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. More recently, they've been floated as a potential defense for the killers of Ahmad Arbery. And those are just two devastating examples of many. And don't worry, we're not going to show you the far too plentiful footage of people getting shot in public places tonight. Frankly, we're just one senseless murder away from HBO Max putting this show in the endless parade of human misery category alongside Chernobyl and Entourage. But given the prevalence of stand your ground laws and the racial disparities in who they do and crucially don't protect, we thought tonight it'd be worth taking a look at them. And let's start with why exactly stand your ground laws were created. Because before they came along, most states already had self-defense laws on the books that traditionally included an element known as a duty to retreat. Right. So this is the alternative to stand your ground, the duty to retreat. Now, let's mean let's see if he says this correctly because most of the time they don't. It's not, it's, it's not a duty to retreat. It's a duty to retreat when you can do so in complete safety. That's kind of important, right? So you didn't have to put yourself at undue risk, even in a duty to retreat state. You just had to retreat if you could in complete safety. The idea being that since you could retreat in complete safety, which is the entire premise of the thing, right? Since you could retreat in complete safety, then your retreating is good because he lives, you live, everyone lives, and then the police can adjudicate it and arrest someone on a different day. That's the idea, right? But then again, trying to figure out what incomplete safety means in practice also is complicated. It, you know, it also gets difficult to figure out. And as I mentioned before, and this also is just true for self-defense in general, you can't take advantage of self-defense law if you are in fault. Self-defense law only applies if you are not in fault. So you can only use lethal self-defense if you didn't start this show, right? You can't preempt your way into it or bootstrap your way into it. So if you're the instigator, you have a problem either way. But 
if you're not the instigator, then you didn't do anything wrong. You have no duty to retreat. And so, you know, all that stuff, you know, all that good stuff. So, you know, yeah. Meaning you couldn't resort to using deadly force in a confrontation if you could safely avoid or de-escalate it. Now, in many states, as I mentioned just now, that's not right. It's not if you could avoid it or if you could de-escalate it. Let's be legally precise here. It was if you could do so in complete safety. An exception to this rule was a so-called castle doctrine, a legal theory arguing that your home is your castle and there you can use deadly force much more broadly to protect yourself against intruders. No, you can't use deadly force more broadly. It changes the where. It changes the duty to retreat part of the equation. It doesn't allow you to use deadly force more than you would have otherwise. It simply changes the conditions slightly under which you can in terms of where. So, yeah. And Castle Doctrine goes pretty far back. Just saying. There's that. The key thing Stand Your Ground Laws did was remove that duty to retreat from public places, basically extending the castle doctrine to anywhere you have a legal right to be. That's not a bad way of putting it. You know, it's not a bad way of putting it. Castle, stand Your Ground is effectively castle doctrine, but not in your home. Yeah, basically. If you have a reasonable fear someone might hurt you, you have just as much right to shoot them in the street as you would if they were coming through the window of your house. And this... It doesn't just have to be you having a reasonable fear. The reasonable fear must also be objectively reasonable. You must have the subjective fear and it must be objectively reasonable. So... And that's true in your house or not. That's true in your house or not. Now, if someone is climbing in through your window, that probably changes the calculation of your fear. But we can dream up a scenario that would not give you the right of self-defense even in your home. Uh, you come to your home, you're out shopping or whatever, you come to your home and there's a burglar there, but the burglar is sleeping on your couch and stranger things have happened. So, you know, can you pull out your gun and shoot the burglar? No, he's sleeping on your couch. But I'm in my home, though. Yeah, I know. But he is imposing an imminent threat to you at that moment. He's sleeping on the couch. You can pull out. You could hold him. At, you could hold him at bay. You can call nine one one. You can leave the house. Call nine one one. You can do a whole bunch of things, right? But you can't just shoot him, even though he's in your house. So if someone's climbing in through a window, that's one thing, right? If you hear a noise downstairs and you come downstairs in the middle of the night and someone is rummaging through your kitchen who shouldn't be there, that's another thing, right? But it still has to be objectively reasonable. If he's sleeping on the couch, even if it's in the middle of the night because he got tired during the middle of his robbery, no. This change was largely thanks to the advocacy of one woman with a pretty compelling story. Marion Hammer says she was walking to her car after... Oh, yeah, this is a great story, man. ...a long day at the office when she was accosted by a car full of men. But she had a surprise for them. I drew the gun up through the headlights of the car, and I aimed at the driver. And somebody in the car screamed, the bitch got a gun. The bitch got a gun. I honestly did not expect to hear that come out of that woman's mouth. Help yourself to some hard candies in the ceramic pig? Absolutely. Take off your boots so you don't track anything on the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting? Of course. But a curse word? In the daylight? Not in 10,000 contractions of the universe. But the important part of her story concerns what she claims a police chief said to her after she told her story publicly. The police chief told me, well, in that situation, if you'd called the police, we'd have arrested you because you were the only one who employed the use of deadly force. I would counter that 
legally there's a bunch of people in the car use a car can be a deadly weapon too so you know but okay police chief you might be on the wrong here and that made me angry and that argument is the absolute core of the case for Stand Your Ground laws, that Marion Hammer could have been arrested for simply defending herself. Now, she wasn't, of course, that didn't happen, but someone said that she might have been, and that made her angry. But a few things there, because while everything about Marion Hammer seems like a sweet, everyday grandmother, right down to this feline glamour shot of her posted on a cat breeder's website, you should know she's also one of the country's most powerful gun lobbyists and a former president of the NRA. She has personally helped push through dozens of gun laws in Florida alone, including a 1987 bill allowing conceal and carry permits, a law then duplicated in some form in almost every state now he, he he's right about the influence of marion hammer he's absolutely right about that i mean marion hammer pretty much single-handedly created concealed carry as we now know it in this country not only with respect to standard ground but with respect to concealed carry laws because at the time in 1986 1986 concealed carry was banned in the vast majority of the country i think four states had lawful concealed carry in 1986 for, and I mean, for shall issue, uh, I mean, that shall issue permits. And there was a whole bunch, and then it was split kind of down the middle between may issue and no issue. And pretty much the entire South was no issue in 1986. In 1987, Marion Hammer comes along and convinces Florida to pass the first modern concealed carry law. There hadn't been a concealed carry law passed before that for like 40 years. I think the last one before that was the state of Washington, which had one, I think, but it had been a long time. I think it was in the 40s. It had been a long time. And Marion Hammer basically single-handedly got concealed carry law passed in Florida. And then John Oliver's right. It got carbon copied, you know, and modified slightly as it went along. But yeah, it basically got modified and then it got adopted in pretty much every state of the country. So they, you know how they say uh, one person can change the world? Marion Hammer did that pretty much. She she went from a reality where there were four states that had shall issue to like all of them pretty much. She single-handedly changed gun law pretty much. So yeah, Marion Hammer should get, get a lot of credit here. She's, she's, a, she's a force, man. Yeah leading to more than 16 million Americans currently having licenses to carry concealed handguns. So, that Margaritaville arsenal that you saw earlier, you have this Dana Carvey character to thank for that situation. And while it's not entirely relevant, you should know Hammer's advocacy wasn't limited just to guns. She also successfully killed a petition from 10,000 schoolchildren to change the Florida State bird to the Scrub Jay, a bird so friendly it apparently eats peanuts out of your hand. Now, she objected because, in her words, Begging for food isn't sweet, it's lazy, and it's a welfare mentality, and they eat the eggs of other birds, that's robbery and murder, I don't think scrub jays can even sing. And okay, slow down there, Marion. Set aside lazy welfare mentality and robbery and murder, which is a lot to put on a bird. Scrub jays can't sing? You might want to tell that to the scrub jay, Marion. <laughs> See? That's fine. Is it great? No, it's not great. It's fine. It's perfectly fine. Sure, the bird is no Mariah, but it's also no Roseanne. If that bird is any, we've we've gone long off. We've gone long off base to be talking about birds and whether or not birds can sing. And she didn't want a particular bird to be the state bird. Okay, I mean, some school children wanted to change the bird, and she didn't want to change the bird. Uh, she's allowed to have an opinion on this, presumably, right? Uh, one would imagine. I mean, whether her opinion is right or wrong, she can have an opinion. 10,000 school children can have an opinion, and she can have an opinion. Like, you know, you might do in a democracy, right? And then the legislature can consider those various opinions and consider all those things as they're determining who the state bird should be. What, what exactly are we advocating for? That if 10,000 school children want a thing, that no one can object? 
No one can say, here's some reasons that what they want is not good. I mean, I'm not saying that we should dismiss the 10,000 school children out of hand. They're entitled to a voice too. They, they, they are entitled to a voice in their, in their government. So I'm not saying let's dismiss the school children out of hand. They're entitled to a voice. They're entitled to advocate for things. It's just not that they're necessarily right. Maybe they are right. You know, maybe they are right. In which case, great. You know, also, I mean, maybe not. But she's, we, we can have an opinion. Or is it that if 10,000 school children want a thing, we have to adopt that thing? Because think of the children. What exactly are we advocating for here? I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be unduly reductivist. But that seems to be the implication of his argument, I think. One, it's Fergie. You heard me. The scrub jay is Fergie. Tweet it, talk it, put it in your pocket. I've made a flimsy take and I'm proud of it. The point is, Marion Hammer played a big part in passing one of the country's first standing ground laws in Florida. And the passage of that bill was immensely useful to the NRA because it became a model for laws that they could then push around the country. Yeah. Wayne Lapierre openly said at the time that Florida was the first step of a multi-state strategy and they were going to use the tailwind to move from state legislature to state legislature. And yep. they did. Yes, they did. Just six years later, standing ground laws had passed in 22 states. And while following the killing of Trayvon Martin, they became increasingly controversial, states did not stop passing the laws. They just slightly slowed down. And Dennis Baxley, one of the state representatives who helped draft Florida's bill, was adamant that it should not be rolled back. We should stand beside law-abiding citizens. They should not be treated as a criminal. They're doing something positive, which is stopping a violent act from occurring. There are going to be times with close calls near the foul line, is it in or is it out? Who's the assailant and who's the victim? Yeah, there are going to be some close calls. Is it in or is it out? Is it right or is it wrong? Is it self-defense or is it a murder provoked by a debate about how much a dog can weigh that turned physical? Who can say? Not that guy. And that is a little bit of the... What the hell are you talking about? What the hell are you talking about? There's going to be close calls. It doesn't matter what the law is. It, there would be different close calls about a different thing. It would just be a different close call about a different thing. If we had duty to retreat in complete safety, the close call would be about whether you could retreat in complete safety. That would be the different close call, right? Sometimes it would be in, sometimes it's out. Sometimes we're not sure because sometimes it's messy, right? Law sometimes get messy, deep thoughts from the lawyer. Law sometimes gets factually messy. And if you want me to say what's cleanly on one side of the line or cleanly on the other side of the line, I can do that. Any lawyer can do that, you know? But if you want to ask, if you want to tell, uh, if you want to figure out exactly where the line is, I hope you've got a lot of money because it's going to take, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot. Uh, yeah, and we're probably not going to be able to determine where the entire line is, but we'll tell you where part of it is. You know, so if, do do you have a million dollars? Maybe we'll figure out where part of the line is for sure. Otherwise, uh, we can tell you where most of the line is, kind of, sort of. But yeah, we'd just be asking different close calls. There's close calls all the time in law. There's close calls about a number, any number of things. So yeah, we'd have to go look, you know, look at the facts and adjudicate the facts like a lawyer might do, like a judge might do. Uh, uh. The point here, the way most state stand your ground laws are constructed, they can make determining questions of guilt incredibly difficult because it all comes down to perceived fear. No, well, it the doesn't. <sighs> the perceived fear has to be objectively reasonable. You legitimately saw someone as a threat, and that is definitionally subjective. What I am afraid of, snakes, clowns, and Tilda Swinton, Jesus Christ, might not be what you are. Yes, John. Yes, John, that's exactly why it's not purely subjective. That would be exactly why, John. Maybe you are afraid of snakes. Maybe you are afraid of clowns. Maybe you're afraid of that Swenson character or whatever her name is. I don't care. Yeah. Are those fears objectively reasonable? 
First of all, it's the snakes. Who cares? Because we're not talking about murder because it's a snake. But yeah, if you're just generally afraid of clowns and there's just a clown at the circus doing clown at circus stuff, amazingly enough, you cannot pull out your firearm and shoot the clown, even though you're afraid of clowns. Wow. Wow. So, yes, what you're subjectively afraid of may change, but it has to be something that's objectively, objectively a fear. And as I pointed out, this this part of it was equally true under the duty to retreat states. It was equally true. Duty to retreat did not change this part of the equation. And it's made even harder by the fact that often the only other person who knows what happened in the incident is now dead. And citing Stand Your Ground as a legal defense has been extremely successful. In Florida alone, as of 2012, nearly 70% of people who claimed it as a defense had gone free. And advocates for these laws will tell you that that's a good thing, that before their introduction, good people were getting sent to jail all of the time simply for defending themselves. Not just but sent to jail, because not just sent to jail, that wasn't necessarily the, the, that wasn't even necessarily the chief concern, although it was definitely a concern. One of the concerns was going through the process of going to court and going to trial, which is expensive, time consuming, frightening. So to prevent people, pre prevent good people from having to go through the process, even if we get the right legal result at the end, because that process is itself burdensome, you know, and 70% of people who claim it go free. Okay. Does that mean 30% don't? Okay. I mean, I, I don't know off the top of my head whether that's good or bad, but it doesn't strike me as absurd. They never had much in the way of actual evidence for that beyond hypotheticals like Marion Hammer's story about how someone said she could have gone to jail, but crucially, she didn't. So, standing ground laws weren't really fixing a problem that needed solving. And the danger. Yes, they were. They were fixing a problem that needed solving because it was changing duty retreat to not duty to retreat. So, it was changing all the people who were convicted because. They had a duty to retreat and did not retreat. And we're like, no, we don't want to do that anymore. So if you want me to find, if you want me to find a list of people that have been convicted and are serving jail because they had a duty to retreat and didn't, and this law would have benefited them, I'm sure we could drag up a list, but you know, what would be the point? they posed were pretty obvious to some from the start. When Georgia was debating a standing ground law in 2006, a local station asked people in the streets what they thought, and watch as their third interviewee realizes something that the first two don't. I think it's a lower crime myself, because a person's going to think twice about running up on a, a citizen if he thinks that citizen's armed. If you feel your life's in danger, I think I think it's a, a good a good law. I think it's going to get a lot of people hurt. Why is that? Well, because when you walked up to me in the parking lot, I didn't know who you were. And by this law, if I felt that you threatened me, I could have just shot you right now. No. You know? No, you can't. I'm going to keep saying it. If the, the fear has to be objectively reasonable, objectively reasonable. So, you know, this guy with the news microphone and presumably camera in tow is like, could he shoot him? No. Even if he was afraid? No. There's nothing to draw an objective fear from. That's not the right statement of the law. Okay. No, that, I can't. That's not right. Yeah, that last guy is completely right. And in hindsight, no, he's not. He's not completely right at all. Neither are you. Maybe we shouldn't have listened to the man in the Pride of the South hat that, by the way, features a portrait of Robert E. Lee over a Confederate flag. That hat alone should have immediately disqualified anything he said. It's like if Anthony Fauci wore this bucket hat that says Daddy in the Shrek font. If he did, you'd be duty-bound to ignore anything that he said. Because the fact is, we now know overall 
Not only do stand your ground laws not deter crime, they may actually increase violence. Mm -hmm. In Stand Your Ground states, homicides overall have increased nearly 11% since the law's enactment, whereas in states without those laws, the homicide rate went down by just over 2%. In fact, another study found such laws translate into an additional 600 homicides per year. And if you're thinking, well, come on, you can't draw a straight line between these specific laws and people's actions. In some cases, you very much can including one of the very first standing ground cases in Texas, that of Joe Horn, who called 911 to report a burglary happening during the day at his next-door neighbor's house. I've got a shotgun. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want me to stop him? Nope. No, don't do that. Uh, Ain't no property worth shooting somebody over, OK? There you go. Joe Horn sounds clearly upset. I am not going to let him get away with it. I can't take a chance on getting killed over this, OK? No. I'm going to shoot. I'm going to shoot. Okay. But the 911 the dispatcher wrong. warns Horn to stay inside at least a dozen separate times. I've got officers coming out there. Also, not to put too fine a point on it, maybe this will come out later, but why is Stand Your Ground going into effect changing this analysis? You're... For any number of reasons, you're not standing your ground. You're you're advancing on their ground and castle. What? what? I don't want you to go outside that house. Then Horn, sounding angrier by the moment, cites the new Texas law. But I have a right to protect myself too, sir, and yes, you understand you that. Yes, and the laws have been changed in this country since September the first, and you know it, and I know it. Well, he misunderstands the law horribly, horribly, and, you know, ignorance of the law and all, so, no, you, you have a right to, you do have a right to protect yourself, you're right about that, but, you know, that's not really what's going on right now, so, no. Yeah. Joe Horn knew what the law said, and no, despite the dispatcher warning him not to go outside 14 times, he did just that and killed two people, with autopsy reports later showing that both men appeared to have been shot in the back. He was explicitly told that property is not worth shooting people over, which is obviously true, and certainly not your neighbour's property. If I found out my neighbour shot and killed two people to save my PS5, I would move tomorrow. I know they're hard to get your hands on, but Jesus Christ, calm down. I don't want your blood console. And thanks to Texas's new standing ground laws, Joe Horn was never arrested and, ultimately, a grand jury declined to ever charge him with a crime. And not only was Horn spared any consequences, he was later celebrated as a hero. You yes. had 911 on and you... Well, I can't speak to why... I can't speak to why he wasn't arrested or why the grand jury didn't indict. I can't speak to that because we only have part of the picture. But given what John Oliver said, which I'm assuming is not a complete picture, I would be surprised that he wasn't arrested and a grand jury wouldn't charge him. Maybe there's more information. Maybe some other things happened. But yeah, it's like, okay, why, why specifically wasn't he arrested? Why specifically did a grand jury fail to indict? What was the evidence picture they were looking at? What don't we know that we're not being told? Uh, you know, law, you know, have to look at the entire picture, right? John Oliver is giving us a piece of the picture. The piece of the picture suggests a particular answer. The answer that we got is inconsistent with the picture. So maybe the picture itself is wrong. That's a reasonable conclusion, right? <laughs> maybe there's more facts that we're not going to be told because it would completely upset the narrative. Given how the rest of the story has been going, that we're not being told something critical seems plausible. You said, I'm going to go stop him. This, you got to get here. I'm going to stop him. They said, no, 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 don't go out. You you stopped them. They came towards you. You shot them. Yes, sir. That's right? correct. And okay. They came towards you. Okay. What else were they doing at the time? Did they have weapons on them? 
So, okay, maybe you went outside of your house. So let's let's try to look at this picture and try to imagine what's happening in our minds. All right, so this guy has a shotgun. He's in his house. He's like, I'm going to go outside there. He goes outside of his house. Apparently, the burglars are approaching him, which suggests the burglars have left the house. They're on their way out of the house. They're coming towards him now. Do they have any weapons? Are they saying stuff? Are they threatening him? What else is happening? I need more information, more information, right? To determine whether this shoot is lawful or not. 911 can't prevent you from leaving your house. Amazingly enough, they can't like stop you. Just because they say we don't want you to doesn't mean that you can't legally. They 911 is giving very good advice, incidentally. I'd recommend following their advice in this situation, but they can't stop you not following their advice. They, it's not legally compelled. So, and he goes outside with his shotgun and now they're approaching him. Seems like we're not being told the whole picture. Seems like something else might be going on. Okay, set aside that Joe Horn looks like what would happen if Bobby Hill grew up and sucked. The only time it's appropriate to cheer after someone says you shot them is if you're talking about the individual responsible for shooting this video of a family of bears in a swimming pool. Question, you saw the bears, you had your phone ready, and you shot them, right? Answer, yes sir, that's correct. Cue the fucking applause, no other circumstances, none. And if these laws on their own weren't bad enough, there is now also a small cottage industry that's cropped up around them selling specialized self-defense legal assistance. Most of these companies offer membership packages, including everything from educational training videos to money for future legal defense and bond. The US Concealed Carry Association insists it's primarily concerned with teaching conflict avoidance, but it also gives you a wallet-sized card with tips on how to handle the call you make to police after you've shot someone, a handy feature that their founder proudly touts to its members. This is my own very own USCCA card. You can see my name well, on it. Well, here's a deep thought. Oh my God. Oh my God. Holy Lord. Did you hear that, guys? Did you hear that? The United States Concealed Carry Association is providing advice on if you make the 911 call, here is what you want to say. Here's not what you want to say. Wow. Amazing. Wow, because maybe what you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. So maybe the words you say on this recorded 911 call may be of some importance to you. So here's what you say, and here's specifically what you don't say. So you know you don't incriminate yourself on the 911 call, or to the extent you are incriminating yourself, you keep it to the barest minimum possible. All right? Here's what to do. Here's what not to do. Oh, my God. They're, give, they're giving legal education to their members. They're giving legal education. Legal education is bad. Okay. Tim Schmidt. On the back of the card actually lists the exact instructions on what to say to a responding officer. To explain, I was attacked, feared for my life, and I had to defend myself. Okay. Setting aside the fact that that looks like the most boring episode of Sports Center imaginable, it does feel important to point out that they've essentially created a get out of jail free card. And oh my God, they've created a get out of jail free card. Did you hear that? They've created a get out of jail free card because by telling you exactly what to say, you won't incriminate yourself. Wow. Oh, my God. They are giving you advice on what to say on the call so the call won't incriminate you. And they're giving you a jail out of free card by saying, here's what you should say. Here's what you shouldn't say. Uh... That, mixed with that man's get-out-of-jail-free complexion, is a pretty awful combination. And at least one of USCCA's clients apparently took the advice on that card and ran with it.
Carlos Garcia's ex-wife, Jailene Ayala, paints him as a loving father who would do anything for his children. She believes he was intoxicated when he showed up to pick up his kids and got into an argument with the next-door neighbor, Nick Julian IV, over him playing loud music in the car. Julian armed himself with a handgun and shot Garcia, he claims, in self-defense. Neighbors came out as Julian IV was on with 911. 911, what is your emergency? Yes, ma'am. I just had a man attack me in my front yard. He attacked me, and I had to use force. I was afraid for my life. Yeah. It seems all you have to do is memorize a few key phrases, and you too could be free to shoot with impunity. It's basically Rosetta Stone for justified homicides. Okay, no. Just because you say the magic words does not... Okay, law doesn't do magic words. The police are probably going to investigate... You know, they're probably going to look into it a little bit, with autopsy probably, you know, if what they observe is inconsistent with that, you know, the words aren't going to save you. But if the words are accurate, if they're an accurate reflection of reality, you know, why not say those words instead of other words that will harm you? We're very bad for giving you legal advice. You want some more here? I'm going to tell you some secrets. Ready for this? Shh. I'm going to tell you some more things that will help keep you out of jail. You ready for this? Don't tell anyone, but you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, one will be provided for you. Because during his 911 call, Nick Julian made sure to say he feared for his life three separate times and can also be heard referring to his wallet and saying to someone, you just need to call them, give them the account number and my attorney. And by the time the police arrived, he was already on the phone with the US Concealed Carry Association setting up his legal defense before his victim had even been declared dead. Oh my God. Oh my God, did you hear that? He has someone else in the house. He's someone else in the house calling the United States Concealed Carry Association, to which he's a member, and getting his attorney on the phone. Whoa! He's getting an attorney while he's calling 911. He's doing a twofer. He's calling 911 to get his victim help and himself help. And simultaneously with that, he's also calling his attorney. Whoa! For legal advice because he thinks he might have some potential legal exposure. Well, what a bastard that he is for wanting to have a lawyer present when the police are about to question him rapidly. Where do you even begin with this? It's like, yeah, I was like, oh, he's very bad because even though his victim isn't dead, because we just were told that, he's calling 911, get him help, and calling his attorney because he thinks maybe having an attorney present might be beneficial to me. Whoa. Deep. And I know it might seem like these laws are just a free-for-all to shoot someone who scares you. But the truth is, there are some limits. There are limits. And you probably know where this is going. Because while most civilian shootings involve people of the same race, when cases involve shootings across racial lines, there are significant disparities in whose fear gets believed. Because the odds a white-on-black homicide was deemed justified by the police were 281% greater than the odds a white-on-white -white homicide was. And the expansion of stand-your-ground laws have appeared to worsen that disparity. A fact I'm pretty sure would surprise exactly two of these three men. Not only that, but there are multiple examples where you would think if ever a stand-your-ground law would apply, this would be the case. And yet it didn't. Take Sawatu Salama Ra, who waved an unloaded, registered gun at a woman she believed was trying to hit her and her young daughter with her car. But even though her state of Michigan has a stand your ground law, and even though that incident clearly falls under a reasonable definition of self-defense without it, and even though she didn't even shoot the gun because, again, it was unloaded, she was sentenced to two years on the charge of using a gun to commit a felony. 
And while, after outcry, she was eventually able to plead to a lesser charge, that wasn't before she'd spent a year in prison and she was pregnant at the time and was forced to give birth in shackles. So, despite being introduced to increase safety... So, yeah, as is as the surprising no one, right? We don't have enough information to adjudicate this. And... I think maybe we're not getting the full picture of this incident. Just guessing, because we've not been getting the full picture of a lot of stuff in this story. So it's reasonable for me to assume, hey, maybe there's more going on. So the way the way John Oliver tells the tale, this woman is standing in front of a car. They're trying to run her down. She waves the gun around, and they arrest her and charge her with using gun and commission of felony. Okay, what felony? Uh, what else is going on here? What else don't we know? Is she, what else is happening? Is she predicating something that she can't use self-defense for? Because you have to be, you have to be a good, you, you can't be a bad actor and claim self-defense, right? So what else is going on in this picture? What aren't else, what else aren't you telling me, John, so that we can properly adjudicate this thing? You know, I'd love to sit here. I would, I'd be more than happy to. I criticize the police plenty on this channel. We do 1983 cases all the time. We criticize we criticize the police. We criticize prosecutors. We criticize the FBI. We criticize everyone. We can criticize everyone on this channel because we try to be fair. And if this truly is miscarriage of justice, I'm more than happy to say it's a miscarriage of justice. But I don't think you're telling me the full story. I doubt you're presenting an accurate picture. I have reason to question your credibility, John. So maybe it is, as you say, maybe this is a travesty of justice, or maybe there's other things going on that would bias our analysis. Heaven forbid that we adjudicate it based on all the relevant facts. Yeah. Safety, stand your ground laws actually increase violence and Given around four centuries of history, basing a law around who's afraid of who was always going to be dangerous. It's the reason Ohio State Legislator Stephanie Howes stood up to oppose her state passing its standing ground law back in 2018. When your presence, when your being, your blackness causes fear. Do you hear what I'm saying? I've been in these, these floors where I hear people tell me, you know people scared of you. It's people I have never interacted with. What do you do in places and spaces when your presence, literally your face, your face causes someone to be fearful of you? This I'm not necessarily sure it's your face that's causing people to be fearful of you. Uh, there might be other factors in this equation. Mm. This is a bad idea for people that look like me. Exactly. That is just one of the things that makes these laws so dangerous. They can exalt a white person's fear over a black person's life and are applied so unevenly the Suatu Salama Ra gave birth in shackles while this guy gets a fucking parade. Stand your ground laws have contributed to a society where vigilantes with guns feel they have the right to decide what is safety who is a threat, and what the punishment should be. No. They have turbocharged everything from road rage incidents to pointless disputes over dog weights. So what can we do? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. Don't pass any more stand your ground laws and repeal the ones that exist. <laughs> They're no. redundant solutions to a made up problem and they are actively doing harm. In the past year, at least 14 bills have been introduced in five states to roll their stand your ground laws back. And if you live in a stand your ground state, especially one where those bills have been introduced, you should absolutely write to your representatives to urge them to repeal them as soon. Yeah, Texas did introduce a bill to repeal stand your ground. They also introduced a bill, bill to adopt concealed carry, or apologize, constitutional carry. Which of these do you think is currently more likely to be signed? into law. I'll give you a hint. Only one of them is currently pending. It wasn't the real, it wasn't the rollback bill. It might have been the other one. Yeah. Soon as possible. And while you're at it, if you do live in Florida or, you know what, fuck it, any state, in the interest of annoying Marion Hammer, why not also demand that they make your state bird the Florida scrub jay so that it can maybe one day deliver its Fergalicious victory song? 
That's a B-plus bird. That bird is fine. That's our show. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week. Good night. Okay, so that was a fair amount of stupid and misinformation and bad legal analysis and bad presentation analysis and all the rest of it. So we we have learned nothing except that John Oliver is not a fair actor. So, you know, yeah. Not a traditional final decision. Can we get analysis of the John Horn case? Well, I don't know. Who is John Horn? Is he someone that was mentioned in this episode? John Horn shooting. Let's take a look. Killed two burglars. Okay, that's the one we saw. So what do we got? Horn exited his home with a shotgun while 911 operator tried to dissuade him. On the 911 tape, he's heard confronting the suspect, saying, move, and you're dead. Immediately founded by the sound of a shotgun blast, followed by two more. Following the shootings, Mr. Horn told the 911 operator that came in the front yard with me, I had no choice. ran towards him. All right, I'll cover it. I'll cover it. I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. I'll make a video about it. I'm not sure what the video will be, it will be but I'll ran I'll towards him. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do it. That's fine. Make a note to myself on Discord. Where's my paid stories folder? I'm in the wrong. No, I'm in the wrong. All right, I'll cover it. I'll cover it. I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. I'll make a video about it. I'm not sure what the video will be, it will be but I'll ran I'll towards them. I need my paid stories tab. Where is my paid stories tab? There it is. All right, cool. We'll do. Anyways, I'm going to sign off for now. I think this has been enough fun legal analysis, don't you? If you're enjoying this legal stream, please remember to give it a like. If you're not already a subscriber, please subscribe for 99 cents. You too can become a supporter of the channel. I've been on Civil Law. I hope all is well. Till later, my friends. Cheers and goodbye.